going to move on to um, Professor Anand Pillau, who this time we have uh, a talk from an orthopedic surgeon. Um, uh, Professor Pillau is a consultant at uh, Manchester. He's trained in very many places, Adelaide, Australia, and Siberia. Um, so he's going to talk um, on the uh, orthopedic surgeon's uh, method of differentiating uh, Charcot from osteomyelitis, a, a difficult issue. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to the chairman and uh, both of us for the opportunity to present here. Now, based on the fact that the next two talks appear to be how to deal with deformities, I think um, it seems to be a conundrum, isn't it? It must be very bad at diagnosing Charcot orthopedic surgeons. So the question is that how do orthopedic surgeons diagnose Charcot? Probably very badly. Um, so to start off with, um, uh, Charcot neuroarthropathy, I think, despite the fact that it was probably, as the first speaker mentioned, uh, described about 150 years ago, it still continues to be a challenge, not just to diagnose it, but also to manage it. Now, the problem is the underlying loss and pain from the neuropathy, which skews the diagnosis. As surgeons, most of us are quite trained to, be, uh, to recognize patterns, and I quite like someone who comes to see me in a clinic to tell me where exactly is a sore. The first thing you ask a patient is, can you point out where it's painful? And the same situation holds good. I think um, earlier Professor Edmonds mentioned about somebody having a sprain and going to A&E. Uh, one of the reasons they would do an x-ray for you is that only if you have got pain, the the rules that you need to have pain, and you need to have an area of pain which actually fits in with the criteria for an x-ray. So the problem with that is that since it doesn't quite fall into this, this pattern recognition, and as we as orthopedic surgeons quite like to see things broken on x-rays, it looks broken, we can fix it, so that's what attracts a lot of even trainees come to orthopedics because the diagnosis is fairly clear from the outset. So I think it seems rather challenging that you ask me as an orthopedic surgeon to speak about a diagnostic conundrum, but I'll try and do my best. Now, the problem is that the misdiagnosis, as we have heard yesterday and, and today, is that it leads to delay in treatment, delay in identifying the problem, which leads to deformities and subsequently, as the previous speaker spoke about, ulcers and amputations. So there are three possible scenarios which I thought would be quite good to discuss, and I think uh, as the talk progresses, um, I will kind of uh, relate you as to what my thought process regarding what might be helpful to identify these. The first one is, uh, is a stage zero or an acute uh, hot swollen foot that presents. Is it infection or is it charcoal? Secondly, you have a situation where you already are managing somebody with an ulcer, and then you get a hot swollen foot on top of that. So is this... Um, a charcoal on top of an ulcer, or is it infection that has now started? And the last thing being is that you have got somebody who's an established charcoal, which subsequently gets ulcerated, uh, then you have a situation where is one, uh, is it a reactivation of charcoal, or a relapse of charcoal, or is it that there's infection on top of charcoal, which is possible. So the history is fairly important, and as uh, orthopedic surgeons, I think we perhaps have quite bad at taking proper history, some of these, some of the times. So the typical presentation is somebody in the 50s or 60s, by and large, uh, the, you can get exceptions, I'm sure. Uh, it can be an acute or a subacute presentation where somebody wakes up overnight with a swollen limb or something that's been going on for a few days before they come to see somebody. Uh, most of these individuals have got a fairly long history of diabetes, uh, either type 1 or type 2. Uh, at least from my experience, I would say that uh, I'm sure, I wonder whether some of my colleagues agree with me, the compliance uh, from the diabetic control in these patients sometimes is generally poor, and they obviously have features of neuropathy. In addition to that, there also might be features of autonomic neuropathy with dry skin, trophic changes of the nails, etc. And on, and on occasions, you get bilateral involvement, or they might give you a history of having had something similar on the other side uh, many years ago, or another part of the foot um, uh, previously. The history of trauma, as uh, Prof. Edmonds mentioned, is sometimes overlooked, and uh, a, a, a proportion of these will have had a history of trauma. If you do tease it out of them, either it'll be one episode or it'll be something which is repeated. Uh, a lot of the time it's now like lockdown, people have been sitting at home, suddenly uh, they all decide to go out for a walk, and you find varying types of problems coming from that in, in a number of individuals. The location, again, is important. Thankfully, I think uh, when you look at where Shaku is most prominent or predominant, it appears to be in Zone 2 and Zone 3. So almost 85% of uh, Shaku neuroarthropathy affects the midfoot. So if you have somebody who comes with a hindfoot or a forefoot problem, 
uh, or swelling sometimes. It helps you to try and uh, rule out the presence of shakuni or arthropathy. But the problem is that when you see them, maybe in a few days' time, the whole foot is swollen. And you can't really identify whether it's a forefoot or a midfoot or a hindfoot. It just looks like a balloon. In physical examination, we talked about temperature. I think it still uh, is a key um, examination feature. Uh, yesterday, we had some really good presentations about how the temperature needs to be examined and measured. Uh, multiple ADS after a period of time after the cast or boot comes off. Uh, most of these individuals have got good vascularity, bounding pulses, in fact. And there are certain risk groups, especially depending on where you work. I think where we work, we get a few transplant patients. They are quite prone to develop uh, shark or neuroarthropathy. And uh, people have had neuroarthropathy or uh, sorry, neuropathy for a number of years. But the key thing here, as uh, Prof. Edmonds mentioned, is that you need to have a very high degree of suspicion. And also, you need to be looking out for this, otherwise it's not easy to pick up. And also, it's about awareness, not just among the medical staff, but also the nursing staff and even junior doctors. The key thing here is that the thing I'm trying to distinguish Charcot neuroarthropathy from is osteomyelitis uh, or infection does not show any favorites. It can happen at any age, it can happen at any time, and generally um, in any age group also. So one of the things which is quite useful to know and do in, the, in a clinical situation is to elevate the limb. Um, in Charcot neuroarthropathy, if you elevate the limb for a, a few minutes, you'll find that the swelling dramatically decreases. It's a good initial screening sign or a test which kind of reinforces what you think might be happening. Uh, this does not generally happen if somebody has got infection, osteomyelitis, or, or, or an abscess, or, or, or cellulitis. Uh, it generally remains the same. If you have got a good going infection, then you might have systemic sepsis. These patients obviously may present with fever, chills, and all the other features of sepsis, including elevated heart rate, respiratory rate, and all the serology generally is elevated depending upon how severe your infection is. In Charcot neuroarthropathy, as, the, as Prof. Edmonds mentioned before, uh, you will get elevation of inflammatory markers, uh, but it's generally not as prominent as you get in infection. But having said that, in infection, depending upon how infection progresses or how severe it is or how, has there been any treatment, uh, you can't really quantify what these markers might be. So the markers on their own is of not really any value to distinguish between the two conditions. Now we come to the presence of ulcers. Now, the, generally in diabetic foot infection, infection is generally a result of an ulcer or a skin breakdown. It's exogenous in origin. It's rarely hematogenous. You can get hematogenous or stromalitis in different situations, but generally in diabetic foot infection, it's exogenous. You need to have an outside in route and a skin breakdown. And when you look at the location of diabetic foot ulcers, the majority of them are in the forefoot or in the hind foot or ADS where there's bony prominence, that's in the calcaneum, in the toes where the rubber can shoes, or under the metatarsal heads. And midfoot ulceration where Charcot is more common uh, is generally as a result of a deformity after Charcot or a direct injury sometimes like stepping on a nail or um, otherwise. There are some other features. I think uh, the size of the ulcer, the depth of the ulcer, the presence of a pus, foul smell, gangrene, a sausage too, um, all these features are more kind of tending towards an infection rather than being sharp when you're arthropathy. So there are some clues in the clinical examination. If you look clearly and carefully, you will find these. The probe to bone test, I think, again, was mentioned earlier yesterday. It's a really good test. I think um, it still has got, I think, there are a number of publications on that from the time Grayson first described it, about its uh, predictive value and how specific and sensitive it is. I think it's a, it is a really good tool, which if you do see somebody with a diabetic foot ulcer, you should probably do. And by and large, I think if you have got a good history, examination features, and a probe to bone test, then I think it'll be hard to miss infection. X-rays. So um, we had an excellent presentation yesterday from uh, Dr. Whitehouse about how you can diagnose stage zero Charcot from an X-ray. I, I think most orthopedic surgeons are probably not very good at this, and I can tell you that I would routinely miss um, a, a stage zero Charcot in an X-ray. But the key here is that it's not just one X-ray which you probably see when someone comes to a clinic. It's either serial X-rays or previous X-rays. I think a lot of these individuals would have had some foot problems before, would have been to a pediatric link before, maybe a toe ulcer. So look at the previous x-rays they've had, which might be on PACS or in a nearby hospital if you've got access to it. Compare that with the x-rays you've got now. 
And you can look for these changes which have been classically described in early Shaku, including a change in density, joint distension, debris, disorganization, dislocation, etc. But by the time it becomes quite you know, visible on x-rays, I think the horses have bolted and it's been too late and the foot has collapsed. So all the classical x-ray features mention all the nice names, the signs, etc. Uh, in x-rays for uh, made for deformity and Charcot and neuroarthropathy are generally after there has been deformity and it's too late after the deformity has set in. Some examples of things you look for, I think, um, so that's called the Mary's line or Mary's ankle. So normally it's a nice straight line going from the talus all the way down to the metatarsal. If you get a midfoot break, you can see that's broken. That's your calcaneal pitch, essentially shows the angle the calcaneum sits in. If that breaks, that has to fall. You can see that will be reduced. Similarly, that's a cuboid, and you can see that as the midfoot breaks, the cuboid height reduces. And as the foot drops, you can also see that the alignment between the forefoot and the hind foot here, which is nice and straight, also deviates to uh, one side. So the guidelines say that you need to do an MRI, and MRI is apparently the, the best investigation for uh, identifying Schalko, and that's true. But the key here is that if you are going to request an MRI scan, you need to have a large field of vision. Um, and I think, I don't know what a colleague's practice would be, that I think when you request an MRI scan, you probably need to request for an MRI of the foot and the ankle. So I've been caught in situations where the MRI scan is cut out just where you know, I think just at the midfoot area, or just distal to the midfoot, they cut it out, or the ankle includes only the calcaneum and a little bit of the navicular, but not quite the entire foot. So you need to ask them to get an extended view, or you need to let them know as to why you want the whole foot scanned. So you want a larger field of view, and that comes only by communicating. And with the newer uh, extra requesting forms, it's a tick box. You can't, unless you tick both, you can't add an extended field of view. Um, Prof. Edmonds briefly spoke about the different sequences you can do, and I'm quite aware that uh, Dr. Johnson is going to speak about uh, MR and CT after me, so I'm just going to gloss over this. So there are different sequences which look for different aspects of the foot. T1 looks for uh, anatomy and fat signal in, in, in the bone marrow. T2 looks at fluid collections, sinus tracts, and cysts. And contrast is quite useful, but be aware of renal failure in patients with um, um, uh, bad, bad renal function. But the problem with MR scans is that when you compare MRI uh, in Charcot and osteomyelitis, it's not straightforward. In both situations, you'll find, apologies. Yeah, in both situations, you'll find that there's marrow edema, there's soft tissue edema, there's joint diffusion, then there's fluid. And both will uh, demonstrate, you know, contrast enhancement, and both will show high signal on T2, uh, fat saturation, and also stir images. Then how do you distinguish between infection and uh, Charcot on MR scans. There are a few salient features which are useful. Uh, the main thing being that in Charcot neuroarthropathy, MR changes are a lot more uh, wider. It involves several bones and joints. Uh, in osteomyelitis, generally involves a single bone. Uh, the subcutaneous edema, the fat edema, the soft tissue edema you see is a lot more prominent in Charcot neuroarthropathy. In infection cellulitis, it dissipates as the cellulitis spreads. And uh, the subchondral cysts, which you see in early Charcot neuroarthropathy, dissipates with bone destruction in uh, infection. It, it disappears. The same with uh, intraarticular loose bodies, which you get as the bone fragment you get in Charcot neuroarthropathy, but in osteomyelitis, it disappears because it gets uh, absorbed. But the key thing from an orthopedic point of view is that what I look for is the secondary changes on scans. So the main thing is that if you have a scan which shows a high signal uptake uh, in the midfoot area, it's an ulcer near that. So that kind of helps you to understand maybe you know, there could be some relationship between where the ulcer is and where the changes on the, on, the, on the scans are. So it could be infection which could be spreading from the ulcer to the area of interest. Is there a sinus tract? Like you can see in this particular scan here, you can see a really lovely sinus tract leading up to the midfoot area and similarly where the ulcer is. But the problem with this is that when you have a, a, a remote radiologist or someone reporting it, unless you convey that message on to your radiologist regarding why you're doing the scan, uh, it's almost impossible because um, they don't know, the, because they don't actually see the patient. So again, the information you put in, in your scan request is important. Or if you do get a scan report which doesn't make sense or which you can't understand, pick up the phone, speak to them, explain to them as to what the patient's foot looks like. Uh, one key thing here is that, I'll show you again, is that if you've got pictures, uh, at least in our trust, we have the ability to put on packs. I've generally found that radiologists always look at previous images 
you normally find even X-ray, they would say that compared to previous films, it looks better or worse. So if you actually have the images on packs, you normally do give them a clue regarding why you're doing what you're doing and what they should be looking for. Uh, similarly, as much as sinus and abscesses, you might also find, uh, sorry, as much as sinus and uh, ulcers, you can also see sometimes abscess on MR scans, which could be useful and points you towards an infection diagnosis. So there's a particular sign called the ghost sign, which I am going to defer to Dr. Johnson to explain, um, <laughs> because apparently it's pathognomonic of uh, Super, uh, is of infection superimposed on osteomyelitis. Essentially means that in certain sequences you don't see the bone, but post contrast it actually becomes visible. I think that is 20 minutes. I don't think I've been. Okay. Okay. So um, thank you very much for. No, no, I think um, oh. it's 20 minutes, I think. Uh, I've only been to 10 minutes yet. Right. <laughs> You have, you, have you got a few more minutes more? Let's go uh, for a few more minutes yeah, more. Yeah, sorry, I, did, yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't ask you to finish. Oh, sorry. I thought, okay. I thought you were... <laughs> no, I got a, I, it flashed up, time is up, sorry, I do apologise, so it's, it's red. Yeah, I, I'll be quick, I'm, I'm, I won't bore you any longer, okay. Um, a few more slides. I think uh, one of the things that is quite useful uh, is, uh, is bone scans. We talked about scintigraphy before. Uh, technician bone scans, which are traditionally used for a lot of orthopedic uh, purposes, including tumors, are not very useful here because both osteomyelitis as well as uh, Charcot-Neuro arthropathy will give you increased uptake. But Indian-labeled WBC scans are very specific for infection, and they help you to know as to whether it's infection or not compared to other bone scans. Uh, it's quite useful, I think, at least in my practice, that if somebody has had metal work, if you had reconstruction done and if there are some concerns regarding a possible infection and you're not able to do a MAR scan or the MAR scan may not be really useful to give the information you're looking for, then a WBC-based scan is quite good to tell you as to whether the infection or not. It's quite specific, but there have been odd occasions where in Charcot or arthropathy you can get false positives. Just be aware of that. It's not always infallible. Equally, spec scans, I think, again, I'll let the radiologist talk about it. Uh, it's a very good test for stage zero shock your arthropathy, or uh, when, you, when you have a, a difficulty in arranging an MR scan. There are patients who are present, they might have a pacemaker, that they've got claustrophobia, you're not able to do an MR scan, uh, then you can do a CT spec, which is a little bit quicker, a little bit kinder, and has got a very high specificity and sensitivity for grade zero charcoal because it does pick up some of the uh, trab mic uh, trabecular microfractures. This is a new kid on the block. Um, I was not aware of this before I prepared for this talk, but apparently it's available in the hospital, and I asked my radiologist why we never do this. He said, you never asked for it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, well, so um, it, it's something they have done for many years. It's got a fancy name. It's uh, uh, FDG PET. It uses um, a, a certain type of glucose, which is actually used as a tracer, and you look for the glucose ac accumulation in the body. And in a typically infection situation, when you have infection, you get slightly higher uptake because the glucose gets metabolized compared to people with Charcot-Neuro arthropathy. And it's supposed to have, if you look at other literature currently available, um, it, it's supposed to have almost 100% ability to distinguish between osteomyelitis and Charcot-Neuro arthropathy. So you might find that there's something that you're available if you are in a current room and you're not able to diagnose uh, clearly what the problem is. It is expensive, it's time consuming, and uh, not readily available because I think uh, in, uh, in, the, in the normal request forms, you might not find it, you need to probably ask for it, but most trusts do have it. But there's no validated studies on uh, differentiating OM and, and, and Charcot and arthropathy with this particular test, and it's something that's evolving, and uh, currently I think uh, availability may be limited. Tissue biopsies, um, again, is a gold standard sometimes because it tells you whether or not just whether it's infection or not. It also tells you what the infective organism is. You can get cultures. It'll guide treatment. Uh, it's useful, especially from an orthopedic point of view, when you're planning to operate, if you're planning to insert more metal work in, then it's quite important to know whether you're actually putting um, uh, uh, metal work into an infected bed or not, so it's quite useful. There are various ways to get a biopsy, but you need to get deep tissue to give you some uh, useful information. 
Uh, but the problem is that if you had previous <coughs> antibiotic uh, therapy, then it gives you a false negative. Uh, where do you sample when you have somebody with a widespread destruction of the food? Which bit do you take? Sometimes it may not be representative. And the last thing is that if you didn't have charcoal before, by doing a, a biopsy, you could actually um, start, by the, the trauma could start an acute onset, a new onset of charcoal. Um, histopathology is useful. It is diagnostic, and uh, there are very clear histopathological signs of both charcoal neuroarthropathy as well as infection. But the problem is that, yes, it's quite diagnostic and useful, but uh, it's time-consuming. You don't get a result back very quickly. I think uh, I'm not sure about uh, most of your hospitals in our, my trust, it takes a few weeks for a pathology report to come back. So by the time, it, it's generally too late to be of use for anybody at all. Uh, but uh, it's quite useful if you are putting, if you're operating, like so my colleagues are going to talk about later on, to take some samples intraoperatively, and as much as you're sending for microbiology, also send for histology, just to confirm that uh, you don't have an infection when you started off. Um, this is something, again, which is fairly new. Um, it's called Sanovir Sure Alpha Defensin. It's a test which was designed primarily to see as to whether or not arthroplasty, joint arthroplasty, hips and knees and other major joints have got infection or not. It's a synovial fluid marker. Um, essentially, it's uh, peptide secreted by neutrophils. The good thing about that, it's not the, the vericacy of the test is not affected by antibiotic therapy. Essentially, it's, we've all been doing lateral flows over the last year, so it should not be difficult for, uh, it's a quite easy test to do now. Um, and um, essentially, you take some joint, some fluid, and the fluid is actually put into the cassette along with the reagent, and it tells you whether there's infection there or not. It's supposed to be extremely accurate, but again, this is not something that's been validated for a diabetic foot infection. Uh, but from a surgical point of view, um, I tend to do this quite routinely now because it's available on the shelf, and uh, if I'm going to put some metal work in there, if I'm not sure, just for a secondary or a final confirmation that I'm putting metal work into a clean bed, uh, there's something that will be quite useful. I think um, this is evolving, and hopefully as more people start using it, hopefully more uh, evidence will come forth. So in summary, I think I've spent the last 20 minutes trying to tell you as to what would be the one test that could distinguish you, uh, you know, infection from charcoal neuroarthropathy. There doesn't seem to be any. I think still you have to rely on your history, uh, location of where the, where, the, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the problem is, is an ulcer there or not, read the ulcer, probe the ulcer, and uh, you always need to have a high index of suspicion. It's about having the awareness that it could be a problem, making sure your juniors and your other staff members are aware. And the diagnosis generally, unfortunately, after all this, still appears to be rather clinical. You need to go with what you think is the best or what you think is the most likely diagnosis and start the treatment early. While you're waiting for all these tests to be done, you need to offload, then get whatever investigation you want to get. And the key here is that you can request an MR scan, you can request... Um, PET scans, uh, FGF scans, etc. But you need to speak to your radiologist because a lot of the time, unless they know what the foot looks like, whether it's an ulcer there, is an abscess there, uh, is the skin broken down, the report you get may not be useful enough for them to actually make um, uh, the correct diagnosis. Um, lastly, an MDT approach is necessary, and I think uh, one of the things I was asking. Uh, um, Dr. Whitehouse yesterday is that in the, when you look at the NICE guidelines, there is an MDT required, but it's a vascular radiologist, and not a, not an MSK radiologist, and so, so should you be looking revisiting that in the future? Because uh, a lot of the time, I think, especially in, in orthopedic practice, when you're operating on them, uh, large operations, I think uh, the involvement of the MSK radiologist is a lot more um, becoming more 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 pertinent and more heavy investigation heavy. Thank you.